Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of this work. Um, I want to give a shout out to my colleague Susan Ford from Case Western Reserve University because she's really the one that does all the work here. She's uh, uh, she carries the whip that drives the Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative, and uh, without her work efforts, I don't know how successful this would be. The other thing I want to make a point is Mark Klebanoff was part of this early work when we started out as well. Well, where do I point it? Oh, okay, wrong one. All right, a uh, little bit of uh, you know credit where credit's due. This work was funded by the uh, uh, Medicare uh, Technical Assistance and Policy Program, and they don't take any responsibility for the results we were able to find. Uh, I also want to uh, identify uh, with objective here of some potentially better practices uh, that relate to how we deliver care to these children. I want to describe the methodology of the State Ohio, Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative, the methodology we use to improve treatment of infants with neonatal absence syndrome, the, the clinical symptoms these kids exhibit after they're born to these mothers who've been abusing opiates primarily, and then discuss some of the practices of standardizing care and the impact that decreasing duration of opioid treatment and uh, on length of stay, et cetera. Now, the Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative is a group of children's hospitals in the state of Ohio who have kind of come together to use improvement science to reduce preterm birth and improve perinatal and preterm newborn outcomes in, in Ohio as quickly as possible. As you probably are aware, I'm not sure our legislature is aware, but <laughs> we have a problem in Ohio with uh, uh, not only the drug abuse problem, but we have a problem with, uh, with uh, infant mortality, et cetera. So, neonatal absence syndrome. These withdrawal symptoms cause these infants to stay in the hospital for an extremely long period of time unless you standardize the care that you deliver to these babies so that you can get them to withdraw in a controlled way and to be able to go home in a timely manner. Now, I was really not, I was aware of neonatal absence syndrome when I went from uh, clinical neonatology to full-time hospital administration in 2008 but I wasn't aware of the impact that the drug problem in the state of Ohio was having on this particular problem. I was initially became aware of it when I was asked to look at why the length of stay in our neonatal intensive care unit at Nationwide Children's Hospital was so long. And when I did deep dive into the data, what pops up is this whole problem of neonatal absence syndrome. And some of these kids were staying in the hospital for three months or longer, and uh, that just was inappropriate. This shows, uh, you've heard earlier today about how this has increased. As you can see, when I was uh, clinically active in 2000, still doing work in 2008, that's where we were at with regard to the drug problem, and look what's happened in the years since. Now, this uh, problem of, uh, of uh, neonatal absence syndrome costs Medicaid. Most of these moms are unmedicated. They're receiving funding from the state of Ohio to cover their health care costs. And uh, it's leading to $133 million in cost in charges over uh, that period of time that these kids are in the hospital. Now, I did some work initially with regard to trying to reduce our length of stay and discovered that by standardizing the care, because what I saw in the neonatal intensive care units, all the doctors were doing things differently. There wasn't a standard way of how we took care of these kids. And so by implementing some standardized protocols, how we approach the, the clinical care of these babies, uh, we were able to reduce our length of stay. Governor Kasich found out about some of this work being done by us, as well as the people at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. And he gave us money to investigate this problem in greater detail. So that's when the initial six children's hospitals came together. Here, they're listed in this slide. These are the large children's hospitals in the state of Ohio. We came together and we started looking at what were the characteristics of the kids that were coming into each of our neonatal intensive care units. And so what we found when we looked at the data was that these were primarily uh, mothers who were young, white, and single, 
80% were on public insurance, 85% had pregnancy complications, 26% were hepatitis C positive, and 80% of them, more than 80% of them, were, were using tobacco, which is kind of corroborates what Mark was saying in the last session. We found that these infant symptoms, after they were born, started about 46 hours after birth, so it wasn't immediate. So we knew maybe mom was a user, but we would watch that youngster to see if, in fact, they started having symptoms. Uh, the opioid treatment across these six children's hospitals was about 20 days with a length of stay of about 22 days, and that reflected some of our early work already with regard to standardize the care for these kids. Uh, they were using between one and one and a half different kinds of drugs, primarily methadone or morphine. Some of us were using phenobarbital, uh, and, and more recently some have been using clonidine as a treatment to help pharmacologically control these kids' symptoms. And when we looked at these six children's hospitals, this uh, bar graph shows in blue the opioid treatment days, and in red, the day of life uh, at the time of discharge, how old the kid was and he went home, which is an approximate measure of how long they were in the hospital. There were two hospitals, I just will mention one was us and the other was Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where we had shorter treatment and we had very much generally shorter length of stay for these kids to be in the hospital. And what was different about our two hospitals compared to the other hospitals was that we had a standardized approach. We were using morphine as a drug to wean these kids off there as they withdrew. And Cincinnati Children's was using methadone. One of the things we discovered, it really didn't matter which drug you used as long as you had a standardized protocol. We did have one hospital that had uh, a shorter length of stay, but a longer treatment time. And what they were doing was sending these babies home to receive medication as an outpatient. Uh, most of the hospitals were not willing to do that. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with quality improvement methodology, but this is a, a run chart. Uh, the median is shown here for, uh, in red for the uh, average length of treatment, and the blue is the uh, average length of stay for these babies. And this is an example of what happens when a hospital that was not doing a very good job with regard to length of stay implements a standardized protocol. And you can see on the far, your far left-hand side, uh, that they had a very high length of stay. Uh, they began to implement a standardized um, pharmacologic protocol, and the length of stay came down so that eventually it was down to about 17 days for treatment and about uh, 20 days or so for, uh, for actual length of stay. So the impact of having a standardized protocol for how you manage these particular babies. We took that information then and said, all right, can we do this with a whole bunch of hospitals? And so we arranged to work with 52 children, uh, pediatric institutions, not all were children's hospitals, they were maternity centers, who were seeing these babies were dealing with their neonatal absence syndrome, had prolonged length of stay, uh, and it was contributing to the cost of health care in the state of Ohio. And so here in, in this graph or this picture, we've got uh, the initial phase with the red stars, and then the later phase we added more hospitals, more level two hospitals, to where we had a total of about uh, uh, 52 hospitals were engaged in this work. Uh, what we were going to use is quality improvement methodology. Uh, what you saw, you see here on the drawing, drawing on this left-hand side of the, uh, my, sorry, your right-hand side, is the improvement methodology for quality improvement. So we asked three questions. What do you try to accomplish? What do you want to improve? How will you know that the change that you're implementing is an improvement? And then what changes can you make? And then we implement plan, do, study, act cycles to evaluate the interventions that we put in place. This is the key driver diagram that we used. And so we have a specific aim. By increasing identification of and compassionate withdrawal treatment for ill-term infants born with neonatal absence syndrome, we reduce the length of stay by 20% across the sites by June 30th, 2015. And then we have a number of drivers. These are the things that we have to implement if we're going to impact that specific aim and to reach our goal. 
So improve recognition and non-judgmental support for nar narcotic addicted women. You know, we have biases in healthcare and uh, sometimes we were kind of uh, judgmental about these women and the way they were hurting their baby. And so that attitude has to change because it has a direct impact on our ability to deliver the care that we need to, because that mom has got to be involved. We want to attain a high reliability with regard to uh, scoring by the nursing staff. We have to evaluate where that infant is. We have a specific scoring tool to do that, and that tells us, helps us understand, can we adjust the medication today? Do we leave it the same? Do we have to increase it a little bit? But the nurses have to collect that information accurately. We have to have a non-pharmacologic approach to manage these babies so that we're using the, the bonding processes that are present in the maternal infant attachment so that these moms are engaged, the babies are feeling loved. Uh, and finally, we had to have this standardized neonatal absence syndrome treatment protocol, either the morphine protocol that we were using at Nationwide Children's Hospital or the methadone protocol that they were using in Cincinnati. So things that we've identified, uh, we found uh, the need for uh, unit-wide treating for all NICU staff about living with uh, opioid use disorder. We had a video that we showed the staff. This was trying to teach them about how to treat these, the nur these mothers with compassionate care. Uh, Trauma-informed care is another terminology we use. We want to share the stories of pregnant women who would experienced uh, these problems, and uh, we had a panel of mothers that would come and share information about what it's like to be a mother in the NICU whose baby is withdrawing and they happen to be a known substance abuser. We had education about addiction as chronic disease and lectures by addiction specialists, and then we had community resource outreach where NICU teams identify community resources within their communities that they can use to help these mothers care for these infants. We engaged in uh, both webinars as well as face-to-face -face learning sessions where the various hospitals came together and shared what they learned using posters like we had today uh, so that others can see what they're doing, what's working in their institution, and uh, uh, what might be useful to use in their own institution. And so this are, these are some of our data. So what I have here are control charts these are uh, the red line, dark red line, solid line is the mean. On the far side, we have the length of treatment, and that decreased 9% from 13.4 days to 12 days. And on the right hand, on this other side, closer to me, we have length of stay decreased by 9%, 9 from 18.3 days to 17 days. This control chart shows the mean and the solid red line, and then the dotted lines represents three standard deviations. So when we have a center line shift, that's the equivalent to having a p-value of 0.05, or depending on the, the amount of the shift. So this is a statistically valid, this is standard statistical process control methodology to look at how changes in a large group of hospitals occur. So we had only a two-day decrease in length of stay, but think about the number of babies that were being cared for among those 52 hospitals. And when you add that all up, it ends up being a pretty significant impact. Now, we were able to publish that work in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in journal pediatrics uh, that told about our collaborative. But we found some interesting things in how the various centers implemented their data protocols. You notice that we have, uh, on the far side, we have our non-pharmacologic bundle, different colors. The uh, dark green, or the medium shade of green is breast milk or low lactose feeds. You could choose if a mom wanted to breastfeed and she was not, she was in a pharmaco, in a, a, a medication treatment program, we would let her breastfeed. Uh, if she was using drugs illegally, not in a treatment program, she had to be uh, placed on uh, some other kind of formula, not breastfeeding. Uh, the, uh, but it could be low lactose formula. Uh, swallowing was the lighter green, and the dark green was a low stimulation environment where these kids become hyperstimulated from their with, in the process of withdrawing. Uh, we found that when we asked the centers about these different 
approaches to non-pharmacologic management of these babies, there was some uncertainty about whether there was benefit to using low lactose feeds or not, or whether there was benefit to using 22 calorie formula or not. Now keep in mind, standard formula is about 19 calories. But you know, these kids are withdrawing and they're burning up a lot of calories. And the thinking is that maybe a higher calorie intake would help to mitigate weight loss as they are being weaned off their medications. So the, st the teams from the various hospitals did not have confidence in whether these were or were not effective uh, approaches to non-pharmacologic management. So we implemented another quality improvement method called orchestrated testing. And this is where we were evaluating two change ideas at the same time. The type of formula we used, low lactose formula or regular lactose formula, or the calorie content, regular calories, 19 calorie per ounce, or 22 calorie per ounce. And we had two levels of each factor uh, were present. So we ended up, each hospital would choose one of these types of approaches to managing the kids. So group one had low lactose standard formula, uh, and then had 22 calorie formula, so it was low lactose, high calorie. Group two had standard lactose or, and high calorie intake, 22 calorie. Group three had low lactose but standard calorie. And group four had low lactose, no lactose, regular lactose and regular calories. And so we were able to use these four treatment methodologies. The institutions did not randomize, they chose what they were going to do and they treated all their babies that particular way, or at least that's what the goal was. And uh, what we measured was the length of stay for those kids that were pharmacologically treated. We looked at treatment failures, and then we were also interested in this issue of weight loss. And we were, particularly if kids were losing more than 10% more than of their weight. Uh, overall, what we found was that 22 calorie formula could be beneficial in practice. It could pr actually preserve the weight of these babies. They didn't lose as many calories in that situation. Uh, we found it was uh, also associated with less treatment failure, and these kids had shorter length of stay if that institution was using the 22 calorie. We did not find any conclusive benefit to the low lactose formula. They were using low lactose because they thought that the lactose might be irritating to the gut. Turns out we don't see much evidence that that seems to be playing a role. It didn't have an effect on length of stay or the duration of treatment. But here you can see another control chart this shows how overall the, uh, the average length of stay for these pharmacologic treated infants changed over time. We had a reduction from 18.2 days to 17 days in that first phase. In this orchestrated testing phase, we decreased from 17 days to 16 days. Again, thinking in terms of the impact of two days reduction overall for the entire state of Ohio, that's a lot of babies that have shortened the length of stay and we reduce the cost to uh, the state of Ohio as a consequence. So now we recommend all infants are treated with decreased stimulation, swaddling, continuous holding, and frequent feedings. That's the non-pharmacologic approach. We encourage breastfeeding if the mother is in a treatment program. And if breast milk is not used, we encourage the use of 22 calorie formula so that it offsets some of the uh, caloric requirements for these kids uh, having being met. We also have a standardized protocol. You can use the morphine protocol or you can use the methadone protocol. It doesn't seem to really matter, although there may be some one advantage over another. For instance, methadone is only a once a day treatment. So there may be some real, and both of these are oral administration. Uh, but our protocol provides guidance with regard to when to start treatment according to what the nursing scores show as to where the kid's at with regard to their withdrawal. It tells us when to escalate therapy so that if the kid is getting worse, we may need to increase the drug that the kid's receiving each day to capture that so that the, control, the infant's withdrawal is under control. We have a guidance with regard to stabilization and then when we wean the kid. Once we get the youngster off the opiate, then we will keep the infant in the hospital for an additional two days uh, to make sure that they've not had some relapse, and then we'll discharge the kid to home. Uh, so this, uh, this project is uh, 
is ongoing still. Uh, we're in the process of writing up these particular re results. Uh, this happens to be the length of opioid treatment. And I want to emphasize there's a lot of people that are involved in this particular work. And so here's the uh, uh, logos from the different organizations that have helped to make this particular process uh, successful. So I'm going to stop. Anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't understand. Repeat your question, please. So the question was, um, the study began in 2014. So you, uh, you are giving morphine to them. Uh, Cincinnati gives uh, methadone. By this time, these kids are three years old or four years old. Are you collecting data regarding how they meet their um, milestones? Yeah. And that's kind of, at this point, that's not part of this project, but each of the institutions has their own neonatal follow-up program, and one of my colleagues at Nationwide Children's Hospital, Natalie Maitre, runs our neonatal absence syndrome clinic and is looking at these kids' development over time. So, you know, we don't have data, but I think Mark kind of uh, uh, showed some of the benefit. We're not seeing major problems in the first couple years, but when they get to school, I mentioned someone at lunch that my daughter is a special ed teacher here in, in uh, Central Ohio. And she says that a lot of the kids that she sees with ADHD and they have a history of both alcohol as well as drug exposure in utero. So it's, something, it's important, but it's going to be a very difficult thing to get the final answer to it. Other comments or questions? Yeah, Mark or uh, Bill? So, um, very impressive results. When I look at that slide, everything starts with an O for Ohio. How, how is this, how are our, our efforts comparing to other states? And how, are, how are we learning from them or teaching them? Are, are these things happening in 50 times over? And is there a way to share? No, they are sharing. Uh, there was a big collaborative. The Vermont Oxford Network did a, a project, a large collaborative on the neonatal absence syndrome. That's where we got the video that we used. We got permission to use it to share with the staff about the, uh, you know, the trauma-informed approach to managing these moms so that they have better effects. So North Carolina's got good at work. Tennessee's doing a lot of work. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are a bunch of other states that have, have similar kind of collaboratives to what we do with Ohio. So are there any efforts to standardize this for all children? Or is this, is this really happening on a state-by-state -state basis? It's, at this point, it's largely happening on a state-by-state -state basis, because where you get the funding for it? I mean, yep. we were fortunate to get the funding from our state to start with. Mm -hmm. And I think each state, Tennessee, for instance, they were able to get their funding through their state efforts. Because it's the state of Ohio that's putting the bill for the care of these kids. And so it only makes sense that they want to uh, you know, help fund this work so that we can get the message spread that there is an approach to manage these kids more effectively. The interesting thing, we don't talk about it here in this particular collaborative, but what we're discovering is that uh, through non-pharmacologic management of these babies, sometimes we can avoid the pharmacologic manage completely. Mm. And if you can keep these moms and these babies together in the postpartum unit, the labor and delivery unit, and let that mom room in for four or five, six days, the baby may not withdraw at all. And then they can go home and be, and this, uh, Dartmouth has shown this, and there have been some other institutions have shown very successfully getting, uh, uh, using a non-pharmacologic approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.